Okay. Hello and welcome to this uh, session uh, of uh, Horasis. Uh, we are going to be talking about a theme which is important for a lot of us about leadership, but not just leadership, but uh, what are the situations in which we take risk and what are the situations in which we don't take a risk? Uh, how do you assess what is the best risk to take and how do you assess uh, what are uh, a risk which is perhaps not taken? Uh, perhaps it needs to be uh, assessed a little bit better. Um, we will be discussing with the uh, uh, global uh, panel as it always is at uh, Horasis. Uh, and uh, our speakers today are Ali Bilaglolu. He is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Dogas Automotive from Turkey. Anil Baskaran, Managing Director, Idea Center Architects from India. Case Everett, uh, he is a partner, Black Isle Global Hong Kong. Uh, I'm hoping that Slava will join us. Slava Solonitsin, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Mighty Buildings USA. And Shofia Slamka, Founder, Amka Consulting, uh, Counseling of uh, Hungary. So I'm going to begin with Ali. And uh, perhaps, Ali, I'll request you to share in, in your experience in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, which have been uh, uh, something which all of us have been struggling to cope with, how do you drive leadership and can you share your experience on, on how you have navigated for yourself and for your company? Well, thank you, Panja, uh, first of all. <clears throat> uh, and uh, I would like to wish everybody that uh, during this COVID-19 corona times, everybody is safe and sound and uh, they will hopefully everybody will say, stay safe and sound. Uh, regarding this subject, you are correct. Uh, the last 18 months to two, two years were really quite challenging, I think, for all the industries. <clears throat> of course, on different levels, I'm sure the challenges for um, for the for the restaurants were a little bit higher than let's say for industrial production. But everybody has to take his share or their share of the risk. And um, if you are coming also to the subject of our meeting today, I think uh, leaders are depending on the subject. Uh, risk avoiders or risk takers. I do not think that the classification uh, in, in general per se would be a correct description of, of a leadership. Um, to make it a little bit more precise maybe, if it comes to human resources, if it comes to the risk I have to take for my employees, it's not only health issues, also if you are running operations overseas, we do have some operations also overseas, uh, I would never take risk in sending an employee overseas or in uh, asking an, an employee to take health risks or uh, taking risks which can which can put his safety or health on danger. Uh, so there, I would uh, quite uh, frankly say that I'm a risk avoider to the utmost. And uh, if you look at the other side of the of the of the risk schedule, uh, I think uh, I would not. Uh, not 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 be be uh, be afraid of taking risks if it's a business which I do know the dynamics where I do know how the business is run. So there I would go uh, for the full risks because I know the dynamics and there uh, I think business leaders have to take a risk. Right, that's a, that's a good thing. I think we have to know what we are getting into before we decide what the risk is, and therefore uh, the difficulty is really in being able to anticipate. Uh, what we are uh, getting into. And I think the uncertainty of what we have seen in the previous months, just when you think that everything is going to be normal, uh, we have a fresh crisis or a fresh wave. Uh, I think that is uh, very well said, uh, Ali. Uh, I'll request uh, Case to come in. Case, you also have a fantastic experience and background, which you shared earlier with me. Uh, you have you have uh, managed several uh, crises which have come out of financial uh, misbehavior, if I can say that, yeah. uh, but perhaps lessons from those which you are applying to the current situation. Well, uh, thank you, Panjal. And it is my honor to be included in the Horasis uh, Global Meeting as a speaker on this uh, great panel. And uh, yeah, my name is Kees Everett. I'm a Dutchman. I'm based in Hong Kong and I've now lived here most of my life. And I'll relate some of uh, the issues to uh, my life before. I lived in the Netherlands for 25 years and then I took my first big risk. I went to the US to study. And after that, I never returned to the Netherlands again. And what happened to me was that via the money markets of London and Tokyo, I ended up in Hong Kong in 1994 and I started to work for a Japanese bank called Mizuho in their capital markets division. 
and I was then responsible for the yen interest rate derivative portfolio. Now, this was risky business because I traded through the 1995 Kobe earthquake, through Nick Leeson and the collapse of bearings, the devaluation of the Thai baht in 1997 and the subsequent Asia crisis, the 1998 Russia crisis, Y2K, the Twin Towers in 2001 and SARS in 2003. And then came 2007, the global financial crisis, because it started in the summer of 2007 with hedge funds that were collapsing and banks were starting to rein in their credit lines. And we took out our credit line to Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers in the summer of 2007. Now, the reverse had happened to me 10 years earlier in 1997 during the Asia crisis when everybody thought that Asian banks were a credit risk. And I realized another storm was brewing. So in order to avoid risk, I then took the riskiest decision of my life. I quit banking in November 2007. Now, subsequently, Bear Stearns collapsed in March 2008, Lehman Brothers the following September. And all my friends afterwards said, hey, why didn't you tell me you saw it coming? And I said, I did tell you. I even quit. And then they replied, yeah, fair point. So in 2008, I joined Black Isle Global to become a coach. And Black Isle is a 30-year-old consultancy with expertise in people development, organizational wellness, and leadership communication. Black Isle's motto is better people, better business, better world. And our client list is extensive and includes many Fortune 500 companies. Of course, a lot of my customers were initially in the financial industry, but I now cover a wide array of clients. And in 2013, I became Managing Director for Asia. And since 2019, I'm a Black Isle Global Partner. And my thoughts on financial risk are well described by Nassim Taleb in his book, Black Swan. Uh, my thoughts on decision-making risk are informed by Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking, Fast and Slow. And my thoughts on managing risk, or more aptly, the dangers of not managing risk, are fantastically explained by, uh, by Michael Lewis in his book, The Fifth Risk. Uh, I'm delighted to be on this panel, and I think I would probably answer the question about what my company did uh, during COVID a little bit later. Uh, thank you, Kes. I think you've been through so many of these. And, and when we all look back at our uh, careers uh, and our work lives, I think these uh, were definite crises. But what we are facing today is uh, not just a business crisis. It's a social mm. crisis. Uh, it's a crisis of health. It's a crisis of environment. Uh, it's a crisis where every single individual on earth and i would say every single species and somehow uh, impacted the the human nature relationship is in question uh, so I, I think uh, everything that we have gone through uh, what you mentioned from from the uh, financial crisis to the uh, previous uh, pandemics which look very small in comparison we are in a completely mm. new uh, situation and i think uh, no one better than shofia to Tell us about this, Shofia. You have also been, uh, you know, counseling people in this uh, current situation, and effectively, it's not physical health, and and you know, you are you have been looking at mental health. So all of us who are professionals or entrepreneurs or business leaders or social leaders, uh, the biggest concern today is how do we come out of this in a way that we can cope with the situation and we are uh, not so. Uh, impacted that we are unable to hold a normal life after that even when you know, the pandemic is under control give us some uh, thoughts about your experience in recent times and what you think is the best way to deal with thanks so much Praja, for the introduction and i'm also really happy to be here with you on this panel and on the horizons meeting generally speaking hi also to the attendees who are listening into this conversation um my thoughts We'll touch on some of what Case shared earlier, starting with taking a risk uh, with education. And I think in my uh, not that long career so far, one of the big risks and uh, or if not the biggest risk that, that I have taken was also relating to education. Uh, I'm from Hungary and I grew up in Hungary. I spent um, s some of my adult life in Hungary as well. And then, uh, and I studied psychology. I, I wanted to become a, a psychologist. And uh, at some point I got an offer from the University of Cambridge to go study there. Uh, and so that was something that I thought would be an amazing opportunity for me. 
the the only problem was uh, that I didn't have enough scholarship to pay for tuition and to pay for the maintenance in a country that is substantially more expensive than the one I grew up in. Um, and so I deferred a year because I couldn't get enough scholarships. Um, and then the next year I started again. I really wanted to go for it. And so long story short, the time when I eventually packed up my things and moved to the United Kingdom, I still left without, I had scholarships, but it wasn't, it wasn't, not all of them were fully confirmed. So I left at the stage of uncertainty to another country, taking the risk that things can go potentially wrong. Luckily, they didn't. Uh, I, I also I use the term luck, but I hope that it was more due to the work that I put into uh, getting all those scholarships and working hard for them so that I can eventually pay for tuition and, and the, the maintenance over there. Um, but then after that, so I studied psychology, I, I uh, successfully finished that program that I was uh, working hard for. And then uh, some, some years later, I was working still in Cambridge in research as a psychologist. And so that center is called the Winton Center for Risk and Evidence Communication. And so what we did there was researching, um, we were researching how people take risks and how we make decisions about our own uh, life, health, uh, and potential mm -hmm. medications when it comes to um, and, and when we have to take risks or when we have to avoid risks. So I did some research in that area uh, and we were, what was interesting was that we, we were also looking at the communication of risk. So uh, one example is we did a research project on how to communicate the risk of um, treatment options for breast cancer patients. How can we best advise people um, well, mostly women. How can we advise them on treatment options and what the risk, what what the risks are that they take? Uh, and then after that, I continued my education, and I'm right now finishing my doctoral program. And then COVID nineteen happened, and so for me, this was a career shifting experience um, because from the United Kingdom, um, I went to Ethiopia to do some field work for my doctoral degree. That's where COVID hit. And then all of a sudden, I had to come back to my home country where I wasn't planning to come. And then all of a sudden, um, in a month's time, what I saw was the number of um, the extreme number of people suffering from stress, anxiety, not being able to cope with uncertainty, not knowing what would happen. And so as a psychologist, what we sign up for as professionals is supporting people in need. So for me, this was, um, you know, a, a professional call, really. So what we what i initiated then was a mental health resource center here in hungary um to support to to offer psychological support to people in need um but then because of my connections in the uk and um and internationally since since i've been working abroad um other people saw that i was doing this and then slowly and naturally came about uh other organizations and then organizations from the private sector asking me if I could do the same for them. Um, and so this is how AMCA counseling was born eventually. Um, and so this is, as you can see, it's a, a bit more than a year long of a story uh, that I've been um, supporting employees of different businesses and organizations in terms of mental health and well-being at the workplace at a really uncertain time. So ju just to finish up with a few thoughts on what happens when we have to take risks or, or when there's uncertainty, how that affects our well-being or mental health. The three most common things that I see across cultures, countries, industries really are stress and anxiety at an increased rate and not just the clinical symptoms. It's not just people who would get diagnosed with a certain mental health problem. It's the everyday person. It's the, the lawyer working at a legal firm. It's the the, the investment manager, it's the at the highest level of executives to the administration um, and, and literally everyone is impacted. So stress and anxiety. Then the second thing is basic functions, how our sleep patterns and eating patterns change. And so these are the, the, this is the little red flag that would everyone would, would experience this. I can't sleep. I sleep too much. So changes there. And then lastly, uh, mood swings. So people saying, over the course of one week, my mood might be changing from really, really happy to really, really 
uh, dissatisfied and anxious and angry even. So these are the three things that I've been seeing really across industries. Uh, as you can see, for me personally, it's also a, it's a new area that I'm working on. So I shifted from more of a clinical psychologist direction to being working with corporates, working with big organizations in supporting their employees. Um, all this in a remote environment. Uh, I think in this particular scenario, I took a risk. I made that career shift. And I'm hoping that in the future, I can also avoid risks that might lead to harm. Um, so back to you, Kranja. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Jofia, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's wonderful. And I think uh, you've started something at the right place at the right time in terms of supporting people. Uh, and this is something I want to bring to Ali's uh, uh, notice as well. Uh, Ali, as a, as a head of an organization and a company, I think as a leader, you also need to worry about the physical and mental health of your team members. Um, and, and sometimes there is a cost attached to it, which a business might find it difficult to, to manage. Uh, and that's where a real leadership decision comes into the picture. How do you take care of your organization? How do you take care of your people? Uh, what has been your experience in terms of helping your organization maintain normalcy, especially at a time when you don't know uh, what lies ahead? As you said, there is a lot of uncertainty. What is a good decision for a leader to take? Thank you, Pajnal. But I have to uh, underline one thing. Unfortunately, because of technical reasons, I cannot hear Sophia. So I do not know really what she said. Uh, I'm sorry, Sophia. Uh, she's frozen on my, on my end of the screen. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, you're right. Our organization is quite big. The Doge Automotive Organization. Uh, with the retail network, uh, which is owned uh, partially by Roche Automotive. Uh, we are an, an organization of 2,400 people uh, working uh, in the distributorship and in the, in the retail outlets. And Doge Automotive is also part of, uh, of Doge Holding. In total, in the Doge Holding, there are around 25, 30,000 people employed. Uh, the variance of 5,000 people quite seems big, but it depends on the project of our construction company, how many people we do have. As you can imagine, if we have construction projects, the number can jump up by four or 5,000 units, depending on the size of the people working there, or uh, will decline if uh, one project is finished. Um, so uh, we do have, of course, on the holding basis, some, some uh, programs where we are looking after the health issues of our managers after a certain level. I think which is also um, uh, more or less an international standard of big companies where they are looking after the health standards of their top executives. Uh, but if we are coming back to my organization, Doge Automotive, um, there we do have also some health programs uh, depending on the age and gender. Um, and um, we do have certain agreements with certain hospitals here in Turkey uh, because the health uh, the health care system in Turkey is not at the same level like the most European countries. So uh, the companies normally take uh, additional care of their, of their employees uh, to take care of health. And um, uh, on top of that, uh, as we are in the, in the, in the customer facing industry and um, in the automotive industry, normally the customers, after they purchase the vehicle, they only come back when they have problems with the cars. So also, this needs sometimes some psychological support for the for the for the employees who are working on the on the retail outlets, because customers can be also very, um, how can I put it, very emotional when it comes to their car in their reactions, and um, they, they 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 are not very open for logical argumentations, as you can imagine. And uh, if you are facing too many of these customers, you as an employee can have also some difficult times. So we do employ a psychologist who is uh, also supporting uh, the people. Uh, and he is also, sorry, it's, it's, a, it's a lady anyhow. She is also supporting our employees at the call center because we do operate our own call center in, uh, in our business in Turkey. So uh, the employees in the call center, they are fully focused on our products only. And uh, we also discovered that from the call center, we can really uh, raise a lot of very talented sales women and salesmen. Uh, the call center is a quite good school for them to, to learn how to deal with customers in their worst situation when they have a problem. So uh, for the psychological health, they can also visit the 
psychological support we do we do have for them. And um, coming back now to the recent developments during Corona times, uh, we have of course limited the number of of customers who can visit at the same time the showroom. First of all, we uh, offered the customers also to come by appointment, not only the service, also to visit the showrooms. And um, during the times when uh, the number of customers were too high, we of course limited the number of customers in the showrooms to avoid the 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 the, the, the risk of, of of spreading out the virus in the showrooms. And um, uh, we took, of course, all the other known, well-known, well-known precautions like the hygiene standards, uh, wearing a mask. This is something I'm, I'm not, I'm not even mentioning. Um, but what we did also is on the service side, because on the um, on the service side, uh, you can understand that the uh, that the um, education level is not as high as on the white color side. We have uh, introduced every every 45 minutes a so-called hygiene break where the people had to wash their hands and uh, change their masks uh, so to make sure that uh, they also keep the hygiene standards to the utmost. Um, so on the operation side, we can proudly say that we didn't have a single case, even uh, even our operation was very customer facing, but we didn't have a single case where the coronavirus was spread out in our showrooms. So um, this is, in a nutshell, how we are taking care of the health situation of our employees. That's wonderful, Ali. I think that's a good example of leadership. Uh, and in case, uh, you know, you talked about the various... Uh, are also frozen on my screen. I do not know if he is speaking or... Okay. I, and can you still hear me? No. I can so see, maybe, uh, yeah, see only case I, now. No, but, but I can yeah. hear Panjal. <laughs> okay. okay. So <laughs> I, I can, thankfully, I can see all, all three of you and I can hear you. Okay. Um, so I'm glad we can continue the conversation. Case, uh, you work with several leaders, the case at your company. So the question that I have for you is uh, at two levels. One is about the leaders that you are working with uh, as, a, as an advisor because your company is working with several other companies and, and you guide the leadership on various matters. How do you see the uh, change in the approach that business leaders have uh, Today, I'd like you to address that, and then maybe we'll. Then you know, I'd also like to know at uh, at Black Dog Isle, uh, you know, how do you also, uh, how how is the organization itself changing? Yeah, uh, actually, it ties in with each other uh, very nicely, Prancel, because obviously, what we have seen uh, in the industry is there are a lot of leaders now asking for help and support in terms of mental wellness, mental well-being for all their employees. Um, and uh, I have been coaching uh, some people on that matter. At one stage, it is very nice to be able to just be able to give uh, a listening ear. But at one stage, you need to be able to get in there and then uh, do something about how people now approach this. Um, luckily, and, and one of the reasons I, I listed all these crises that we had before, because out of crisis also comes opportunity, right? That's that is um, uh, normally the uh, that is the Chinese sign for danger. Um, so anything that's dangerous is a crisis, but also an opportunity. Therefore, um, what I did was I got myself into a program to get myself accredited as a mental fitness coach. And in terms of metal, uh, becoming a mental fitness coach, it helps people to actually deal with. Um, what you described, Sophia, uh, in terms of stress, anxiety, you know, it's a coping mechanism, uh, eating, sleeping, mood swings. I think we all do these things every once in a while, whereby we, we either go for a run or we meditate or, we, you know, we do something physical to actually get our mind of things. Uh, you can be very deliberate in how you go about this. You can be very deliberate in how you are going to make sure that you don't get sabotaged and fall into negative thinking and therefore spiraling down, but instead arresting that process, making a switch and taking a, a, a positive view of the world. Um, I have been able to actually help quite a few executives through that process. Um, uh, who are, case, if, I, if I can, case if I may interrupt you for a yeah. minute, I, I also want to understand that when you make this effort and intervention, how does it help them in taking good business decisions? Because... Today, the critical point is 
how do you take the right business decision when you don't have enough information when there is uncertainty when your physical and mental well being is not of course uh, in a as it would be in a normal situation but mm. ability to take risks for the business in this situation is something which requires very deep uh, strength and leadership isn't it uh yes and it really is an internal process that people need to go through and what and what uh, and they need to take time for that as well uh, quite often what happens in these stressful situations is that uh, people snap and they go into the first action that they can give in order to make sure that they handle the situation as opposed to taking a step back taking stock and then going through the motions of what might actually be the best course of action and uh, where i have been uh being able to help is to to have leaders then take stock with me in a situation where you go one on one and uh, are in a very safe environment and uh, this is and all of these business decisions then obviously uh they will be backed up by a team i don't think that leaders nowadays uh, need to decide by themselves what they can do much better is uh, essentially not focus as much on profit but more on the purpose of what they are trying to achieve um and therefore not nickel and diming an organization but really taking a, a much more long term and holistic view uh, now obviously that is sometimes going to upset the shareholders but i think that given the circumstances that we had during covid quite a few shareholders are going to say like okay we'll forgive you this one we get it All right we understand that you're also trying to save the, the families we're also trying to uh, that you there for the employees and that you're not trying to make very rash and and short term decisions um and that has been very helpful great uh, the good news is that anil has joined us so i'm going to go to anil uh, now anil if you can hear and see me um yeah, yeah. Uh, great anil so you you probably heard i saw that you will listening into a conversation and we are really looking at you know what defines achievement in a situation like we are all in uh, what defines uh, leadership is the meaning of leadership different today than it was maybe uh, in january 2020 uh, perhaps you can share with your experience on what the best uh, option is and how do you interpret leadership okay um, my interpretation of leadership would be a one who leads the entire planet as such in especially in today's context uh, some uh, when i started my practice 20 plus years ago as an architect and urban planner in bangalore in india uh case can you hear me the, can you hear me yeah. yes i think there was yeah. some uh, glitch uh, but please continue anil okay. all right uh, so i was just saying that 20 plus years ago when i started my practice as an architect and urban planner in bangalore in india um the question i ask myself is this what should i be a leader in and the the um my own answer to that question was this i think i uh, i thought i should be a leader in uh, um in uh, doing something which is absolutely planet friendly and environmental friendly so to answer your question in today's the today's context of the ongoing pandemic i think is even more relevant because maximizing revenue and profit was the norm for the leadership and was a norm for success not anymore as that is the way i see it uh, i see it i see that uh, my feeling is that the the success today is redefined uh, in, especially in the context of the planet rebooting and the, the the disruptive change that we see all over the world due to the pandemic so the leadership to me is leading the planet the right right way in the right direction in your work let's say in your work you say that uh, profit uh, and bottom line and sales is not the target so what should then be the target for a leader in this situation if if that is not the target that's the foundation on which a business is built yes uh, so i i if you if you if you uh, look at what i said i use the keyword maximize so i think our aim should not be maximizing the profit 
uh, maximizing the revenue and the bottom line of the profit but we should definitely survive comfortably so i think a balance has to be struck between these two elements there there is a dichotomy of you know making maximum amount of money from the business that you're running but uh, you need to look at the social values and the environmental values that how and these social and environmental values are affected by your your own business so there has to be a balance between the two so uh, when i started this business uh, my business so this question was uh, uh, staring at me so which is the direction which is the pathway which is the route i have to take so i decided that i am going to take the route which is uh, making which is to make the world a better place to live in uh, now uh, according to the norms of success uh, you are maximizing the profit and maximizing revenue there is a clash between making the world a better place to live in versus maximizing your profit so what i did was i chose uh, uh, so which and this meant that i could not work with all the projects what were all the projects that were available in the market this meant that i could not work with all the clients i could work with only the ones i i who understood the values that i stood for and my business stood for now to summarize uh, what has happened the last 20 years i have no regrets we have completed 100 projects and we have been published in about uh, we have been published about 150 times in magazines and newspapers we have received five awards and 11 cites citations so far for doing only environmental friendly buildings environment friendly landscape uh, environmental friendly city planning so that is where we stand as of now we would like to take this journey forward further uh and add more value to the, to to what we have been doing so far thanks anil jofia this this brings to me a question that uh, today I, i think when you talk to several people perhaps the personal definition of success has changed uh the way success was dis- defined earlier uh leadership can be at a individual level or it can be at a organizational level but for individuals perhaps uh the way they want to be seen as uh, having achieved something is different what is your experience in this so thank you for that question franjal i think it's a re- it's such a relevant one um i'll give a comment on that and i will also briefly touch on um what aniel has said um in terms of what success to, means to people i think what has been very interesting to observe through through the clients that i'm speaking with is that this crisis and perhaps this would be true regarding other crises as well perhaps um case would know that very well um people question routines um because we have to make a stop as to how things have been uh, we are kind of forced to do that because of the crisis and then we have to think about where we are at and what we're going to do next and so something that has been quite interesting for me to see was the number of and it still is the number of people in um highly competitive um jobs who question whether what they do makes sense and to what extent it makes sense and whether they get a personal a personality level gain from it so this is one thing the other is um some people do come to the realization that they don't have a definition of success for themselves which i think is a really um tricky reali- realization to come to because unless we have a goal to reach we will always be rushing for something new something next and our motivation is going to remain external so if you look at motivation theories from the field of so- social psychology that the classic definition would be i'm externally or internally motivated and unless we have our own definition of success or outcomes or criteria that we want to achieve or criteria according to which we define whether we are successful we are going to use other people's measures and so that can be something quite harmful especially when we come to the realization that we haven't yet um defined these questions for ourselves on the point of um anil in regards to how we build or or how we build a business that is not only maximizing profit but is also adding value to the world um so i'm quite new to this to 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 the world of building a business and um 
and, and, and I've never studied it. And so for me, it's actually very interesting to see traditional models of building a business and newer models of building a business. So I actually came, you know, when I was on a number of occasions revising my business model, I added clauses that my business advisors never told me that I should, but I thought I actually could and it would make sense, including how I make my own business sustainable, of, of course, from an environmental perspective, but also from a from a people perspective. So I'm, I'm going to be working with other psychologists. The people on my team currently are other psychologists working remotely. How do I make sure that not only do we support other people not getting to a level of burnout, but also that ourselves are going to remain healthy, we maximize profit, of course, we have to remain profitable, but that we remain safe and sound in what we do. So now I'm adding clauses that I think are not traditionally part of a business model, but for me, they are. And I actually, my bet is that this is going to remain uh, the case that we're going to think a bit more about sustainability in terms of social values, in terms of people who work with us and for us. And we'll see where that leads us. Thank you. That's very well said, uh, Sophia. Uh, Ali, I, I'll come to all of you now, maybe just for a minute each uh, for uh, the reason that we will have to end in the next uh, seven, eight minutes. Okay, Ali has gone. But case, I, I, you know, the word I want to use is motivation. I think Sophia uh, used that word very, very well. Uh, how do you motivate leadership today? And I'm going to put this question to you, Case, and I'm going to put this question to you, Anil. Uh, but first, mm -hmm. Case. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think um, Anil and I were on the same page when he started to talk about not maximizing the profits, but looking really at the purpose of what you're trying to achieve. So one of the things that my company did was we incorporated our motto into our logo. So and, and our motto is better people, better business, better world. And what we're trying to do is we, we're trying to create better people. And through that process, create better business, which will then hopefully at one stage lead to a better world. It is the shortest way, you know, it's six words that we can tell essentially why we are doing uh, what we are doing. And I think um, in terms of motivation, that's probably all you need. Anil, go ahead, please. And then I'll yeah. go to Ali. Okay. Uh, I think that's a very uh, good question, uh, Pranchal. And... Uh, I feel uh, the best way to motivate your team uh, is to lead from the front, number one. Number two, uh, I'm a true believer in that uh, 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 motto, uh, you lead from the front. And when you lead from the front, you, the, you're on, on the firing line, first of all. And secondly, uh, you have to be absolutely sincere about the, the the project that you're working on, the your effort that you're putting in, and people, the believe me when I, when I say this, people can actually smell sincerity from a distance. They can actually feel it. The vibes that you're giving away uh, when you're with the group, they can actually feel it. So sincerity is second point. First is leading from the front. Second is sincerity, and third is the integrity factor. You have to. You cannot. Open your chest and talk. If your hands are dipped in corruption, if your hands are completely dipped in mud, so one has to have clean hands, not to have blood on your hands. Clean hands talk about high morality. So when you talk from a strength of morality, then you can actually motivate your team to such a point, and uh, they will be performing exceedingly well. And the last point that I want to make is where I've seen always seen that you have to talk not just about a particular aspect of a particular project or you know this specific goal you have to talk about the larger vision what are you going to achieve you know so that vision has to be painted nicely to the team and so that they will be able to understand the goal is not just uh, the sum of its parts, it it should be larger than the sum of its parts. So that is why I call the vision. See, these four points put together, I think, can motivate the team very well. Thank you, Anil. 
Uh, I'm going to come to Ali uh, on the same question. Ali, I don't know how much you could hear, but the question is that for leadership, it's not enough to to talk about your own leadership, but also to motivate others. But before you answer that, I'm going to uh, tell uh, Jofia that I'm going to come to you last, Jofia, and I'm going to ask you for one advice that you would give to leaders across the world. So hold that thought and think of a, a nice uh, advice to give to all of us. But until then, uh, let me request Ali to respond to this thought about motivating leadership uh, for not just yourself, because you can be self-motivated. How do you also inspire uh, leadership at every level with the people who work with you? Thank you very much. But uh, since my last, since, since I was speaking last time and until now, I was totally disconnected. So I couldn't follow any discussions. I'm sorry, therefore, oh, there were some technical difficulties uh, yes unfortunately um, I think I think uh, motivating people is, it's also a cultural aspect I think motivating your 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 managers your employees in Turkey is different than in Germany I worked in both countries I worked also in Dubai and uh, it's also a big question of, of a cultural cultural uh, heritage I would say because motivating people in Germany is quite different than motivating people in Turkey so uh, let's let's focus on 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 my existing position now. Uh, how I motivate my uh, my managers and my employees is um, uh, if first of all uh, the targets we are agreeing on uh, we should really agree on. It's not something uh, the moment when you are managing top down uh, and you have a very let's say rough management style people maybe will say yes to whatever you say because they're afraid of your reaction but this is not going to be a sustainable way of of management so therefore my experience is uh, when you can achieve uh, a certain trust level with your people and you really honestly agree together on a target and on the on the on the subjects then um, this is for them also a big motivation because um, if you honestly make a decision on achieving certain targets then um, the, the the employees and uh, and uh, my, my my people are more committed to reach this target sometimes than I am uh, because they believe in what they are doing. So I think the main the main motivation aspect or my way how to motivate them is is simply by really involving them in the decision process. And if you do this, uh, then the rest is more or less a self run. I would say. Thank you. Um, I think that's that's a great thought to leave for all our uh, viewers and also for other leaders. So, um, Rufia, I'm going to come to you and ask you to close uh, for a closing thought on uh, you know what is the best advice you can give leadership uh, on how to navigate in these times. Thank you, Pranja. What a privilege to be giving a, a final thought here. And as I was thinking of the, the experiences I had in the past year, talking to, to, to leaders as well as different uh, employees working across sectors, I think that the, if, if, if there's one thing that I, I wish leaders could um, consider is that weakness can be a strength. And the reason why I say this is because we'll, we all have our weak points, uh, whether it's in our personality characteristics or whether it's in our work. And being able to say it out, own it, and then say, I'm willing to work on it with you uh, as colleagues. Um, I think that's an ability that many people can work on. And I think that's something that will build better teams. And so is there for an advice that can guide us in a time of crisis. So shortly, weakness can really be a strength. So thank, thank you, Pranja, for that. Thank you. And to all of you, uh, Kais, Anil, and uh, Ali, uh, for joining us, and all of you who could uh, hear us and uh, participate in this discussion. I think leadership works best in times of crisis, and I hope that this crisis is over soon. But until then, uh, our best wishes to all of you and thank you once again for joining. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Everybody, thank and everyone. Nice to all of you. Yeah. Nice to meet you.